when we recognize distinctions, some differences in the Word of God, we're going to recognize that God has a different way of life for us, the church, the body of Christ, to live by. And it has to do with living by the grace from God. We also know that if we live by the grace of God, we do so in part by living by faith. Living by faith. Not just doing an act of faith now and then, but actually living, functioning by faith. Hence the word stewardship or the same word for the house rule or management that we had in Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to look today at a couple of other promises regard to what do we do when we sin or some things we have to keep in mind when we're struggling with our sin nature or the world system or uh, maybe succumbing to an, a temptation from Satan. And we'll take a look at those in just a moment. I'm Pastor Tim Holscher, and uh, we've been looking at how to read our Bibles for a long time. And for the last quite a few studies in here, we've been getting to the point of if, when, if we study our Bible in this way, what does that mean for how you and I live? And it has to do with living by grace and living by faith. And so we've been taking a look at some of those things. Again, and I, I'm not great at self-promotion, but if these studies are helpful for you, you know, giving a like down below, that actually is really good uh, for the channel, the way people look at that. And I would in encourage you to subscribe if you haven't already and share this. Uh, let somebody else know if you got some friends you think would benefit from this, go ahead and share that information with them. But on with the important thing, and that is, looking at the Word of God. If we're living by grace and living by faith, we need to know, to live by faith, some of God's promises, which we've been looking at. And sometimes we feel like Paul does. Romans chapter 7 and verse 24. Now, one of the things that is helpful to keep in mind what's going on in Romans chapter 7 is Romans 7 is divided into two sections. In the first section, Paul speaks in the past tense. He uses what we would call the Greek aorist tense. And that doesn't mean past, but that's the, the sense of it in, that, in the first part of Romans 7. And so as Paul's talking about his past and what he learned uh, about living under the law. And in the last half then, we're, we, we are expecting Paul to say, so I had all this struggle back here and now, hey, we've got it going. But you know what he tells us in the last part of chapter 7? He says, and he's writing, he switches over to a Greek present tense. He's indicating with a whole bunch of present tense, I still have this struggle. Now, that doesn't mean that Paul's Christian life is a mess. He's just trying to make it clear to the Roman believers, I've still got this problem. Some of us get the foolish idea, if you're a Christian long enough, pretty soon everything just starts to click and it starts to go. No, hopefully you grow so that you do know more regularly how to respond to problems and challenges, how to respond to temptation. But that doesn't mean you don't face temptations and struggles and such. Still face them. And so as Paul is talking about these things with, with us, he's simply saying at the end of this, you know what, I still got this struggle and I still find myself Romans 7, 24. I think Paul says, this. I still can feel like this as I'm writing this. That may not be my situation right at this moment, but it's still something that I deal with. You ever feel like that? You're like, man, I've been a Christian for a long time. I, I personally have been a Christian for over 50 years. And I can testify, there are times I still feel like, oh, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? And I know one day the Lord will come back for me, but sometimes it's like, man, we just keep living down here. And, and you know, maybe, maybe God gave me all kinds of opportunities to serve and to minister this week, and I was encouraged by what God's doing in me, this very inadequate, at inadequate vessel or tool, and he does that. And then I have a day that I go off the rails and I sin or I'm not thinking right and I get wrapped up in stuff and I'm just like, Why? why am I still dealing with this? Because we're not glorified yet and we're still like Paul. We're still going to have those days and sometimes maybe several in a row where we feel like that wretched man. But there's some things that the Apostle Paul tells us that are promises that we need to remember. Now, one of them we've already looked at, but I thought it wouldn't hurt us to go back and hit it again. Romans 8.1. 
there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're a believer in Christ, you are in Christ, and because you're in Christ, God sees you as free of condemnation. Even if you, like Paul, just a couple verses before, were saying, I'm a wretched, miserable man. But there's no condemnation because God sees you in Christ. But we move towards the end of the chapter and we're facing some other things as he's going through some of the problems we as Christians go through. And I know I've hit these verses before. Some of you go, yes, we've heard these. But you know what? If you're like me, sometimes you need to be reminded of them again and again. Because when you're going through something hard, you're not responding like you're supposed to. You're maybe even sinning, or at the very least, maybe you're trespassing. You sometimes need to be reminded, as Paul says, Romans 8.31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up uh, delivered him up over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? Do you ever feel like after you've sinned or something that it's like someone's going to say, hey, that person can't be a Christian. That person can't, they can't be here because they did da, 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 fill in whatever blank it is. Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? Well, God is the one who justifies or declares us righteous. So God declared you righteous, then he's going to turn around and entertain a charge against you or bring a charge against you. Who's the one that condemns? Christ is the one that, he's even said this in the Gospel of John, he's the judge. We've got other passages, again, that say he's the judge. Is he going to turn around and condemn you? Well, let's look. He's the one who died. In other words, he died in our place for our sins. He was even raised. He's even at the right hand of God. He's even interceding for us. And he's going to turn around and then condemn you after he's done all that? That's all counterproductive. No, he's not going to. So... Who will separate us from the love of Christ? In other words, and I would say, he's not going to die for you again. He's not going to rise for you again. But he is interceding for you. Who's going to get him to stop interceding? I'm not going to intercede for Tim anymore. I can't do that. Because that guy sinned. He sinned yesterday and he sinned on Wednesday. And No. He's going to keep interceding for us. So who's going to separate you from the love of Christ? And then he lists a bunch of things. Tribulation, that it's going through hardship, going through tight places. Spiritually, he's talking about emotionally, spiritually tight places. Persecution, famine, nakedness. In other words, danger, sword. Why does he mention all those things? Because, you know, it's sometimes when you're going through all that crazy stuff, eh, we sometimes we go off the rails and then we, we get so wrapped up in that stuff and so upset that then we don't think right and we end up easily moving into sin. Just as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. But in all of these things, we actually are overwhelmingly, con or we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. And then Paul goes on and even says, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life. Now I would say the death meaning the prospect of death. Maybe he's talking literally about just literally dying, but I would just suggest maybe the prospect of death, fear of death, nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things that are present, nor things to come. Oh, we worry. We spend a lot of time. We make a lot of bad decisions because we're worried about what's going to happen today or what's going to happen tomorrow. But he says, all that, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Notice it's in Christ Jesus. Why does he say it's God's love to us in Christ Jesus? Because God in his love continues to say that you and I, as believers, are in Christ. And all that other stuff can't get him to stop that. So maybe we're like Paul, and we're going, Oh, wretched man, who's going to rescue me? I'm so tired of this. Number one, no condemnation. Number two, Christ is not going to stop loving you. He's going to keep on interceding for you. He's not going to entertain a charge against you. And three, God the Father is not going to stop saying that you're in Christ. Those are three promises that dramatically affect the way we think when we're facing struggles and problems, maybe even going so far as sin and trespasses. Promise that you and I need to recognize, and it makes a difference as we're living by faith. So as always, 
Have a great day in the Lord, and thank you for joining me.